Good evening, everyone. I uh, hope you're well. Thank you for joining us this evening. Welcome to the Competitor's Ultimate Guide to Sim Racing with guest speaker Scott Mantle, founder of Driver61. Um, also joining the panel on the call is Becky Maidman and myself, Katie Baldwin from Motorsport UK. And we're primarily here just to monitor the Q&A and field any questions for Scott as we move through. Uh, before we begin, just a few housekeeping points to note. Um, please be aware that this webinar has been recorded. Um, as mentioned, there's a Q&A function, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to ask any questions, please post them on here and they'll either be answered naturally through uh, the presentation when Scott, um, as Scott kind of discusses the, the topic or um, when he pauses to take questions and we'll field them then. Um, that's all from me. Um, enjoy the session and I'll now hand over to Scott. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, tonight and taking the time. Um, sim racing is a really in interesting subject uh, for myself and a lot of our clients um, and, and audience at Driver61, both from just the pure enjoyment of sim racing um, itself, but also for how it can supplement and, and improve your real world uh, racing performance. And, as sim racing and sims have got better and better uh, over the last probably five years, it for sure they can help um, your, your real world performance. So I'm gonna go over um, some broad topics within sim racing, um, the software that we're using, uh, the type of sim that is probably most beneficial and how to use the sim to improve your real world performance. So um, just a little bit about myself, if you don't know. Um, I've been sim racing uh, since 2015. So pausing and restarting in, uh, in the racing games. Um, I founded Driver61 uh, five years ago now, and we are uh, an online resource for racing drivers. We have tutorials, uh, free tutorials, free circuit guides that hopefully you've seen, and our ultimate game, um, ultimate aim is to to help uh, racing drivers. I've been racing myself for over 25 years, won numerous uh, European championships and raced and been lucky enough to race and test uh, hundreds of cars over the years from Fun Cup and Master MX-5s all the way up to 25 or actually 30 uh, different Formula One cars and GP2 cars, F2 cars, as you can see in this image uh, to the right. Um, for the last 15 years, um, I've been coaching as well. Uh, I've covered hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles uh, over that time in the passenger seat. I've trained for brands such as Ferrari Motorsport and Lotus and Renault F1 teams. And last year alone, um, I worked directly with 120 different drivers uh, through our training programs, um, which means 26,000 miles in the same car on the same track. Um, and with those kinds of figures, you, uh, you really get a broad understanding of, of how club and amateur drivers work and, uh, and the kind of barriers that they face when they're driving on track. And as I mentioned before, I've been sim racing since 2015. So just a little bit about Drive61. And if you saw the previous seminar, then I'm sure you, you know this already, but uh, I'll just whisk through it quite quickly. We train amateur and professional racing drivers, probably 80% amateur drivers and 20% pros. Uh, we have the world's most popular online training program, the Drivers University, which you can see on the right-hand side of the screen here. They're whiteboard tutorials, uh, fairly in-depth or very in-depth, uh, things like how to trail break, understanding weight transfer, how to extract the most from your race car on track. Um, we also have in-depth circuit guides. So we've got uh, Brands Hatch, Silverstone, Spa, for example, um, all 30 to 45 minutes uh, long and uh, explaining things like where you should be looking on the circuit, um, some braking references and, and different lines that you can take through the various corners. Um, and I mean, it's a, it's a real privilege that these things are, are very popular. They've been viewed over a million times uh, over on YouTube and on the website. Then uh, three, three or four years ago, I took a step back from the normal coaching that I was doing where I was kind of following five or six drivers a year around um, the circuits of, of the world. 
and actually looked at how I could try and teach drivers um, more quickly. Um, and with that, we've developed uh, our own driver training programs where we isolate individual techniques and layer up those techniques uh, throughout our training program. So we start off with the fundamentals, um, vision, how you load a car up into a corner, and then we actually go on to actually, how do you find the limit and how do you manipulate that limit once you get there to extract more grip from your car? We found that a lot of club drivers um, had never really experienced the limit of a car in a predictable way. And we wanted to give them that skill and give them that skill whereby they could figure out how to be fast themselves rather than just being told. And uh, that equates to working with over 250 drivers, more than that now actually, getting close to 300 drivers in the last three years through our real world training programs. So it's an absolute pleasure to work with all those drivers. Now we've got a team, um, well, a team. we've got three of us uh, who do the coaching uh, with, with all those club drivers. We also, um, about nine months ago, at the end of last year, started to train uh, sim racers. And now we uh, work with over 300 sim racers a month. Um, obviously, that market's a bit bigger. And we, we run them through um, a fairly similar concepts that we actually run our drivers through in the real world. Um, the goal of Drive 61 um, overall is to open up motorsport to as many drivers as possible, get them up to speed, keep them interested in, in this sport that we, that we all love and make them feel comfortable and confident um, in their race cars. Um, Cause there's nothing worse than, uh, than running around the circuit and, and not being quite sure when the thing's going to slide or let go. And that's what we, we try to do. So just, just a few points um, about the, the journey that we all go through and this relates to the sim as well. Um, but you know, this seminar is about how we can use the sim to help our real world racing. At the end of the day, we're focused on, on the real world. We want to be quick, quick in the real world, but the sim is a, a good option to help that. So the journey begins from, you know, the first time you do a track day or, or, or a test day with somebody all the way up to when you are on the podium and hopefully winning races. And it's actually quite a predictable uh, journey, the steps that you have to go through. When you take it, when we've taken this this look back and this kind of over overall view, um, there are very definitive points as as you go and as you develop as a driver. And there are certain problems that also come along at various points that are very actually very predictable uh, moments. Um, if you do understand these kind of blockages and these these issues that you might have, whether that be how to trail brake or overslowing a car into a corner or not actually understanding racecraft particularly well and, and what's fair and what's what's legal with racecraft. Um, if, if you know where these issues are, then obviously you can navigate this journey much more quickly. Um, and there are six um, stages through, through this journey. First of all, you need to have perfect car control how do you trail brake? How do you get the perfect amount of rotation? How do you have the natural feel of a driver? Then it moves to actually finding the limit and expanding that limit. The limit is a band. It isn't just a single line. I've got to the limit, the car sliding. Actually, you can go beyond that. And through manipulating your technique and assessing what's happening with the car at one point in a corner, and then adapting your technique to suit that, you actually open up the limit limit you gem generate more grip and therefore you can corner faster you also need to get up to pace for example in a in a short qualifying session quickly and uh, get up to the limit quickly and also minimize mistakes and um, so over a race stint it's really important that we minimize any errors that you have because they can really easily accumulate to tens of seconds over a race distance um, we also need to make sure that we uh, utilize our track time really efficiently and that you continually make um, steps forward over testing and a race weekend. Otherwise, you're going to left, get left behind. The difference between um, a decent driver and a very good driver is that they will build up session upon session. And even within that session, they might be tweaking setup or pushing themselves that little bit harder 
understanding the circuit conditions that little bit better, which ultimately means that they're going to end up on the podium. Um, as I just mentioned briefly in that last point, setup is also very important. It can be the last percent or so of lap time. Um, and so it's really important that you give accurate and honest feedback um, and, it, and that you have an efficient strategy to develop your car and move it forward. So understanding what feels fast and what you need to change after understanding what's limiting the car from going more quickly. And then finally, um, you need to understand how packs of cars work at the start of a race, for example, or just general racecraft when you catch somebody up and want to overtake them uh, in a confident way, in an assertive way, in a way that means that you're not going to risk any contacts. And all of these points um, on the driver's journey can actually be supplemented or improved on within the sim if done in the right way. So the big question, um, and I've heard many drivers kind of on either side of the fence with their sim is, is sim racing actually useful for real world training? And for me, with, with all the experience that I've got in kind of bridging the gap between sim and, and real world racing, I would say it's, a, it's an absolute yes, but it has to be done properly. You have to have the right equipment, you have to be using the right um, software, and you have to be approaching uh, the situation in the right frame of mind um, so that it will in fact help your real world performance rather than hinder it, because it is possible that you can go the wrong way and it actually means that you build some bad habits. So of course, there's multiple uh, pros to the sim. You get unlimited track time. You can just keep on lapping. It's cheap-ish. You know, uh, I was just talking to Katie be before this and talking about this is my sim behind. Um, it, <laughs> I say cheap-ish because if you really want to be able to work on your technique properly, you're going to have to spend uh, a bit of money um, so that you get the, the uh, high quality feeling through the steering wheel so that you get the good feeling on the brake pedal, uh, for example. But I'm going to go into more detail about that a little bit later on. And of course, um, the risk and danger is, is lower. Obviously, nowadays with modern uh, safety and the circuits, things are much safer. But when you're sat in your front room, it's obviously as safe as it possibly can be. Sims are great for learning circuits, even if you're kind of at the, the lower end using a PlayStation and, you know, a Logitech steering wheel. You can still use a sim for learning which way uh, a circuit goes and understanding the flow of a circuit. If you do go uh to more of the higher end sims and you've got it set up properly you can use it for building proper technique a uh, hundred percent you can use it to understand how you find the limit properly you can use it to improve your trail braking you can use it to improve your racecraft there's many things and of course i'm going to go into those in a bit more detail uh, later on it also helps build your mental capacity. If you were here for our last seminar, I spoke a lot about mental capacity and how easy it is to overload yourself uh, when we go out testing. And this is one of the things that we focus on in our real world training is that we hire a circuit um, exclusively. We break all of the techniques down into small little bite-sized pieces because if you imagine a typical test day or a track day, we're going out there, we're trying to brake as late as possible, turn the car in the, at the right point, get on the throttle as early as we can. There's 20 other cars, 30 other cars on the track with us. There's just too many things going on for us to really absorb and learn as much as possible. It's like trying to learn to juggle with 10 balls right from the beginning. It's never going to happen or it's, you know, it's going to happen much more slowly than if you just started off with, with a couple. And so within sim racing, you can actually have a very consistent environment. The circuit can stay the same. The tires don't go off. You can do whatever you want on the track. And so you can build up 
uh, your, your capacity, you can train yourself, and then you can gradually begin to go racing and change a few of the, the variables within that. But it does give you a very stable environment to start off uh, this process. It also really helps with eye racing and with, with sorry, your racecraft and, and, and with absorbing pressure um, in that area. And I'm going to talk a bit more about one of the software that we use, but um, there's a software that I'm sure you've, you've heard about called iRacing. And the racing on there is actually very good uh, because they have a specialized like penalty system. And so you approach the racing like you would do in the real world. You can't take any risks when you overtake, otherwise you get disqualified and that affects your driver rating and so on. But basically the mental approach that you take here um, is pretty similar to the real world. And actually when I'm doing a, an online race, I feel more nervous than I do in the real world. I think because you're kind of isolated here and there isn't, you know, you don't have that kind of physical movement in the sim, um, it's easy to get a bit more nervous. So it, it, the sims are very good for learning how to deal with this pressure that we would get in the real world. And along the same lines, you get more exposure to racecraft. You get more frequent exposure to racecraft. One of the things um, that is quite difficult to, to train um, in, in our training programs or impossible is racecraft. Okay, I mean, the, the situations are that you, you obviously can't practice that in anything other than a race. Um, and the situations aren't repeatable. You know, you can't, you can't, um, have the same situation happening twice. And so when we coach racecraft, you always have to do an, an analysis after the fact. Um, but in the sim, you can, you know, you can do 20 races a day if you really wanted to. And so you just get more exposure to racecraft and, and you learn how cars flow around each other when, when you're in traffic. And so it's absolutely fantastic for that. And then on to um, the final point uh, along your driver's journey is that it allows you to try um, set up in a consistent environment. Some issues with the real world is that you'll make a setup change in between sessions of a test day. And if there's an hour and a half between those sessions, well, the circuit's changed um, you know, in that time, whether there's you know, rubber being put down into the track the track temperatures changed or, you know, people are dropping oil and so on. There's too many variables going on. And sometimes it can be difficult to actually understand if a setup change has actually made the difference uh, between sessions. In the sim, as I mentioned before, you can have consistent uh, weather conditions, con consistent track conditions. And so you can begin to understand how various different setup changes will affect a race car. Now, I will say that some of the sims are better than others in terms of how realistic a spring changes or a damper changes compared to the real world. And I mean, all of them have slight kind of holes within that because obviously it's quite a difficult thing for them to model and they're not quite there yet. But I would say that 80% of the changes are very similar to what would um, happen in the real world. So what aren't sims useful for? Um, they, you know, they aren't the, the golden ticket. They, they are, are there to be used, but you, know, you do need to be wary of a few things. The first one, and probably the most obvious, is that you don't have absolute feeling in a sim. You're basically sat there static, um, and you don't have that seat, you know, seat of your pants feeling. You don't have the G-force um, in your body. So at the moment, there is no other solution uh, for that other than actually getting on track in the real world and feeling that. And so we, we, you know, we can't replicate that at the moment. I'm sure one day it, it will happen in the future. Um, but you, you know, for the moment we, we can't do that. Um, I mentioned this as a pro, but there it's also a con that there's no danger aspect to it. So this is what I mentioned when you need to use Sims, um, you know, in a conscious way, you don't want to go in with the frame of mind that you can just, you know, click restart and go again, go straight out the pits, go off at the third corner and just restart again. 
if you are using the sim to improve your real world performance you really need to approach it in the same way that you would do in the real world try not to go off because we don't want to kind of get you into that frame of mind of course you can build those bad habits as i've just mentioned too easy to crash and reset again i, I mentioned this as a pro but it is also a con you have that unlimited track time but in the real world we have very limited track time and so what i try to do is keep my sessions quite short so that i'm finding the limit of the car quickly in a way that i would do in the real world the ability to have repetition is great but if it takes you grinding out 100 laps to get to the pace that's not going to help you in the real world and so there's two kind of separate things here and this is where some of the if you've ever seen any of the sim races that go into the real world racing some of them do struggle because they get quick in the sim just through massive repetition you know six seven eight hours a day of repeating the same laps over and over again so of course they're going to get quick but that doesn't really help you in the real world so i would say you know less is more in some cases where you can um you can actually do too much work and and just going through off muscle memory rather than having a kind of proactive plan as i spoke about in our last seminar and then of course depending on the software that you use and uh, the kind of level of drive you are the race crash is sometimes less than perfect um you get drivers who can approach racing in quite an aggressive way and take more risks than we probably would definitely would in the real world um, and that's one reason why I, the i racing software is is so good because it actually does a good job in controlling this so just um a few points about what kind of sims are useful um i have uh i have numerous conversations with you know many many real world drivers and they tell me they have a sim and I asked them, oh, you know, what software do you use? What kind of um, steering wheel do you use? And it, you know, it, it, it turns out that they have, a, you know, like a Logitech plastic steering wheel. They have a 25 inch monitor that's miles away from them. And they have, you know, um, only linear uh, potentiometer brake pedals and, and, and throttle pedals. And while that's, okay um for learning circuits as i mentioned before if you really want to learn a proper technique you would need to have uh, a simulator that that has a load cell brake pedal so it's the brake pressure that that the computer actually recognizes rather than just the the distance of the brake pedal you need to have a high quality steering wheel and and so on um the reason that I mention this, and I, I'm going to go through the kind of three different types of simulator, broadly speaking, in a few moments. Um, but the reason that I mention this is that you need to understand the limitations of the, the equipment that you're using. If, you know, if it isn't up to scratch, then only use it for learning a circuit, um, learning the direction of a circuit. Uh, if you really want to work on that technique, you need to be giving yourself the right information. You know, one of the areas where sims struggle is that you don't get as much um, information from the circuit and, and your vision as you would do in the real world. And so because we are limited with the, the information that we're getting from the computer, um, that information needs to be as high quality as, as you can get. And when it's coming through a belt driven um, or a gear driven plastic steering wheel, and 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 you know not not very high quality pedals then it's uh it's a different story so um i just wanted to go over what kind of are the most important pieces of equipment if you want to replicate the real world experience in the sim and first of all it's got to be the pedals um really just the brake pedal um i was just showing katie earlier actually um the there's certain qualities of pedals. What you really want is you want to have something with a low cell in it, which means that it's taking, this is, this is one of my pedals here. So you can see the quality of the equipment. Um, these have load cells in them, which means that when you press the brake pedal, it 
the computer understands the load going through the pedal rather than um, rather than the distance that some pedals actually use. This is really important that you've got a high quality pedal, brake pedal especially, um, because you you know you guys know how important the brake pedal is for trail braking and manipulating the balance in the car as we're coming into the corner. And if you don't have that, and if you don't have the right feeling, you're really going to struggle. And actually, when you don't have you know the right pedals or the right steering wheel, the the difference between the real world and sim racing it, it becomes a different thing. And so it doesn't supplement your real world racing particularly well. The next thing is uh, a steering wheel. Um, you know, uh, you, you've got a, a few different types, which I'm going to run through. You've got the, the Logitech type, like I've been speaking about. You've got uh, like a Fanatec belt driven type, and then you've got the direct drive wheels. And they obviously get more expensive as you go um, up the, the higher quality, but the detail and the feeling that you get in the wheel um, improves significantly. So you can feel the understeer in the car. You can feel when the car rotates in the higher end wheels. And so that's why it's critically important that you have these um, high quality pieces of equipment, but also set up properly so that you are getting an equivalent feeling through the steering wheel that you would get in the real world. The next thing is, especially for real world racers, um, I would say VR is, is, is important and actually isn't that expensive. A, a VR headset is actually cheaper than, than a big monitor here. So I've got this big monitor you can see behind me. I've also got VR but the VR is like significantly cheaper than the screen. And um, the reason that real world racers um, generally prefer the VR is because it projects onto your eyes um, a, diff a slightly different image. So you get 3D, you get the perception of depth, which really helps with consistency. It also really helps to develop your vision when you're out on the circuit. And if you saw the last seminar or any of our videos online, you know how important vision is to being quick on track and um and so i found that real world races will go much more quickly and actually even more importantly more consistently without going off if they use vr so that's the, the third thing that you should uh should take a look at then the rig i mean it's not that important all you need is something nice and sturdy it doesn't really matter how it looks you just need to make sure that nothing flexes obviously um depending on the type of car that you're driving in the sim and the, the wheel that you have, the forces can actually be quite high. And so you don't want anything kind of flexing when you're turning the car into a corner. You want all of that feedback direct into your hands, not going through uh, the rig. And finally, the software. There aren't too many options with the software that you, you will be using. So uh, that's why it's uh, last, oh, one but last on the list. Finally, it's uh, the hydraulic motion. We've all seen these crazy sims that go up and down, round and round. And uh, I've used a, a few of them. And to be honest with you, I, you know, they're definitely not worth the money. And I don't even think they're, they're really worth having. Um, I've, I've, I've been on a couple where there's, you know, they have two posts and it just hints at kind of rolling the car over as you turn in. So it gives you that feeling of, of knowing when the car's rolled and the tires flexed underneath it. It can be a bit beneficial, but for the, the money that they cost, um, it probably doesn't improve your driving or the feeling that you have uh, significantly. So um, I'm just gonna go over a few types of sims very quickly. <clears throat> First of all, we have uh, a basic sim here. You can see um, things to note here, the wheel, I think that's a Logitech wheel. Uh, a little screen, which means when you have it set up like this, you're not able to use your peripheral vision as you would do on a normal, um, uh, well, in the real world. You you don't have this peripheral uh, vision on, on the side here. And so you're limited uh, by what you can see. Also that um, the field of view there is set up wrong, it's too far away. Uh, and then, yeah, the, the pedals will only have, will only, um, work off uh, a linear potentiometer, not a load cell. And so that really affects the feel that you have um, on, the, on, on the brake pedal. 
the you know a, a, a sim like this if it's running through a playstation or an xbox would typically use some kind of software like gran turismo sport or forza and even within that software the cars don't have realistic dynamics um i think usually because they're played with a pad or something like that that the, the window in which the car sits is, is typically way too big um, and the dynamics just uh, uh, unusual. Um, so you have to get into the kind of the PC software, iRacing, Assetto Corsa, for example, to really get the proper dynamics, which is what we need if we want the sim to supplement our real world driving. And a, a, a setup like this could cost you uh, around a thousand pounds, maybe even less if you already have the PlayStation and, and so on. Um, you can use that for learning a circuit, a uh, very basic technique, uh, like kind of understanding the fundamentals of a racing line, but beyond that, it isn't, uh, it isn't great. And of course you can, you can use it for a little bit of mental capacity if you're kind of driving in a race and, and so on. There's no realistic feel really, uh, in these, you know, the feedback in the wheel isn't particularly good. You're not immersed properly. You can see how far away that screen is. Um, you, you're not using your peripheral vision, as, as I mentioned, and so it isn't particularly realistic. And you're separated from the real world experience. Next step up is uh, a, a, an advanced sim that you can see here. This is actually uh, one of my friend's simulators. You can see here, he's, uh, he's got a Fanatec direct drive wheel. Uh, so the feeling in the wheel will be will be really good, really detailed. He's got some Huizingvelt uh, pedals, which is actually the pedals that I just showed you, which have the load cell in the brake pedal. He's got a shifter there, which is great if you are driving anything that has uh, a gear stick. Um, and he'll be running something, because he's got a PC, he'll be running software like iRacing, Assetto Corsa, where the car's dynamics are very realistic compared to the, the real world. And um, the, the important thing here is he's, he's, he's got the three screens there, as you can see, but you can see on the seat that he's got a VR headset as well, which is, I think, really important, as I mentioned, for the real world drivers. And this will cost you uh, between four and 10,000 pounds. So as I mentioned at the start, it isn't cheap. It is a chunk of money, but this is a, is a good sim if you want to do all those things and improve your technique, understand trail braking, learn how to heel and toe, how to control rotation and so on. Um, this is about where you need to spend. Now down at the lower end, you can buy all the bits yourself and plug them together what I will say is that these things all need setting up well. Um, if you don't do the research and get into it and really understand the settings in the wheel and the pedals and also the graphics, um, then you're not going to get a realistic experience. Towards the top end there is if you buy one ready to go from some kind of you know, distributor who, who builds them and sets them up. That's the important thing. Um, it's all well and good buying all the bits, but if it's not set up properly, it isn't going to do the job um, as well as it could do. Steering feels real. You can feel the understeer, you can feel the oversteer. Um, the VR means it's real, really good immersion. And actually, I will say, like when you're in a race and you're using the VR, if you haven't used VR before, sometimes you can forget that you're in there. It feels so real uh, when you've got it on. And with, the, uh, with the, the kind of current generation of headsets, the resolution is so good that it's difficult to actually tell. Um, you know, it's, the, the older ones, you could see pixels in the screen because the resolution wasn't very good. But nowadays, you, you know, it's, it's getting more and more difficult to, to see that. Um, but when, you know, when you're in the thick of it and having a race, it feels so real. So it really puts you in there. And that also means that um, you feel the pressure, you feel the kind of adrenaline that you would do pretty much in the real world. So these are great for learning technique, as I explained, for pushing yourself, for finding the limit, for racecraft, for setup, and so on. And they really help with, with capacity. Again, when you're kind of around another 20 drivers on track and you're in a real race um, with other people online, it really helps to build that and, and build your um, resilience to pressure. 
Cons are it's expensive. And uh, still, although the brake pedals are very good, it's the kind of Achilles heel of Sims because you don't, you know, you can't quite feel when it locks up like you would do in the real world. And so you end up relying on your other senses somewhat. You can hear the tires screeching. You can see it um, if you're in a if you're in a single seater, for example. But you don't quite get that feel. So actually, sometimes driving in the sim is more difficult than the real world because you do have um, kind of uh, less information coming at you, like through your backside, and uh, and the g-force and the feeling uh, in that brake pedal. And then finally, we've got the kind of sims that are, are just for exhibitions and, and stag do's. I think <laughs> these are the big um, hydraulic sims that try to, to simulate the feeling that you would have uh, in the real world. I think they cost, you know, 20 to 50 grand, I'm sure. Some of the kind of smaller hydraulic ones uh, are a bit cheaper. But, you know, you can't simulate the prolonged g-force that you feel or you can simulate even with the hydraulics is kind of getting on the brakes and then kind of accelerating but you can't make it continue because there just isn't the space to do that like i say i've been on i've never been on one this extreme that i'm showing in the in the picture here but i've been on a few motion uh, platforms and it, it's uh, at the moment it's a bit more of a gimmick than it than, than it's really worth in my opinion um like i say if if they just move a little bit just to kind of simulate turning in and just initially getting on the brakes. It's a little bit more information. That, that's all you're looking for with the sim is for it to give you as much information as you can so that you, you can you know, drive the car on the limit properly. But um, these things are just going way too far. Very expensive, doesn't actually add too much value. And um, of course, you've then got to calibrate it and you've got another thing to, uh, to think about. So um, I've gone over kind of what kind of hardware and equipment is right. Just very quickly wanted to go through the software that we use and what's useful if you do want to improve your on-track performance. Um, you might ask why do you need different software? Well, there's, you know, depending on what car you're racing, um, iRacing might not have it, various other softwares might have it. And so you might need to flick between different pieces of software to get the right car and track combination that you want. Um, a lot of the circuits, as you probably know, are now laser scanned. So the details in them are very good, but a couple of the circuits haven't been laser scanned. And so they've just been designed. And so the bumps aren't really in the right place. Some of the, you know, the feeling of the track just isn't quite there. Um, so you might want to flick between different uh, software for that. You've got iRacing. Um, the physics are great in iRacing. The car reacts how you expect it to in most cases. Um, you know, the, the car will rotate if you trail brake in too much. It will undersee if you kind of bleed in the throttle uh, too heavily, too early in the corner. That's why I say it's really good for actually learning your, your, your technique and building that kind of foundational level of, of technique. As I mentioned before, iRacing is fantastic for, for real racing. You get put in a group of very equivalent drivers to yourself. Uh, there's always thousands of people racing online. Um, there's this penalty system and a, a kind of rating system. So if you, you know, tap somebody multiple times in a race, you'll actually get disqualified and they'll remove you from the race. And so, what it does is it puts everybody in the right frame of mind. So you'll actually find um, that most of the racing on there is very sensible um, and quite realistic um, when compared to the real world. There's another piece of software called Assetto Corsa. Again, the physics are very good um, in Assetto Corsa and it's very realistic in terms of, of, of playing with the car. There's a fantastic variety of cars and tracks in Assetto. So what you might not find in iRacing, you will find um, in Assetto. Uh, but the online racing is difficult to set up and there's no rating system there. So the online races, unless you're kind of part of a private group of drivers, uh, typically the, the kind of public online racing there can be very, very messy and it isn't really worthwhile because people are you know, driving into each other. R-Factor, again, a lot of um, 
a lot of the the, the bigger uh, sim companies where you might go and hire some time such as guys at silverstone and, and, and so on and they typically use r factor or the professional version of r factor which allows you to map your specific race car change the power change the grip the downforce and so on uh, within that um but the base level of r factor again the physics are really really good um there's a, a big variety of cars. You can download lots of modifications. Some are better than others, to be honest with you. But typically, the physics are very good in R Factor. And again, there's a good variety of cars, uh, of, of tracks as well. Um, but again, the online racing is, is difficult to manage. So basically, I use a mixture of, of these three, depending on the car um, or the circuit that I want. And I only use iRacing for, you know, for, for, for racing um and because it's the, the kind of most well regulated one out there um and yeah i, I would stay away from from software such as um project cars gran turismo sport and, and forza um just because the physics are very separate to, to the real world you know of course if you're going out there and just want to learn a circuit then by all means go and do that but understand that it's only to learn the circuit and, and we don't want to build any bad habits there because it's very easy to do with the massive repetition that you can get um, on the sim. So uh, how do we actually use the sims uh, to improve our real world performance? Again, I would say to you, use it with caution and use it consciously. Don't just pound around um, it's the same in the in the in the real world, you know, with the points that I mentioned at the start. You know, you need to use your track time efficiently. You don't just want to pound around uh, building bad habits. If you've got the right um, equipment, you can 100% train uh, like you would do in the real world. And 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 like our real world training programs, I would suggest beginning with vision. Vision is everything. Um, using it to actually um, train your eyes for scanning coming into the corner, looking through the corner. That gets a bit easier if you use VR because you do have that depth perception, although it can still be done on uh, you know, a, a wraparound screen as well. Of course, you can use it for, for steering. Um, if you do have a, a quality wheel here, like I've got in, in this picture, which is my old sim, you can feel when the car rolls over and loads up. You can feel when that loads going through the tire. And so you can practice this over and over again, understanding where that limit is and build that muscle memory so that when you do go um, in the real world, it's there and it's your kind of, you know, your fundamental technique, your base level technique is already embedded. Um, of course, you can use it for braking. And what's actually really good is, you know, when I when we train drivers in the sim, it's exactly the same as as the real world. The process that we go through is exactly the same. So typically, we try to get the car to the limit, um, to a limit in the mid corner um, phase, and then once we've got the car to a limit, we think about which end of the car is limiting us from going faster. So imagine you're coming into a corner, you're on the brakes, you're easing up, but you're still you trail braking into the corner and the rear of the car is sliding. Well, if that were the case, the front of the car, if it was a mechanically gripped car, not an aero car, but even in an aero car really, um, in that case, the front of the car has got too much grip. It's got too much weight over it. And so, the likeliness is, is that you're trailing the brakes too much. The nose is pushing those front tires into the track and the rear is up in the air feeling a little bit lively. If you have the right kind of sim, you will feel all of this. So in that case, we need to assess what's going on. What's stopping us from going faster is the rear of the car in that situation. So what can I do with my technique? Well, I can ease up off the brakes a little bit earlier, shift some of that weight allow the front to rise up, shift some of that weight to the rear of the car to get rid of the oversteer. And therefore, we improve the balance of the car, improve the overall grip of the car, and we should be able to go through the corner more quickly. When you 
increase the limit in that way, you then have proper technique and it could be that the car's not actually sliding uh, or not at the limit again, because you've gone in with the same speed, but you've improved your technique, generated more grip. And so now you're sitting actually just below the limit. So you end up going up in steps where you'll be at a limit, then you'll improve your technique at that speed. Um, and then you go a bit quicker and then you improve your technique at that speed and you keep on going like this until you actually get to the absolute limit. And, and as I mentioned in the last seminar, the difference between kind of self-imposed limit, dropping grip out of the car with poor technique and the absolute limit is actually quite significant. And so what the sim is useful for in this situation, as long as you're consciously kind of working toward this, is the process, the journey of finding the limit and then assessing what you're doing and manipulating your driving style to, um, to, to generate as much grip. This is what we do, you know, all the time in, in our real world training programs. But the sim is great for kind of compounding this and, 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 and building upon that, uh, whereby you, you just, you, you run through this journey multiple times on, on multiple corners and it's the process that's important, not the, you know, the absolute values uh, in the pedals, because, you know, it, it will be slightly different between the sim and the real world. It's just getting there and, and, and going through that process and discovering how to get fast. I've just mentioned uh, about the limit. Now, the, the, the one thing about the sim, as I mentioned before, is that you can actually um, learn racecraft in, 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 a, in, a, in a different environment. Um, it, it's actually really good in, in some ways, the flexibility that you have in the sim. So for example, that braking technique that I just mentioned, in, in our sim course, we actually teach drivers to trail brake on an oval. And we do it on an oval. I mean, it, it's a little bit boring because you're just going round and round, but we do it on a tight oval because it's basically the same corner over and over again. And so you can really um, get massive repetition and you can really uh, hone in on really precise trail braking technique there. And you can just keep on doing it. Of course, that's something that we can't really do um, in the real world, but it's great that you have the flexibility to do that in the sim. And it goes the same with racecraft. Uh, aside from having the option to do multiple um, you know, races in an evening, and um, we actually run classes whereby we have eight drivers and we have four. We, we run it actually like, you know, like a like a martial arts lesson where we pair drivers up or put them in small groups. And then we have them a defender and an attacker. And one person obviously has to defend. The other person has to try and find a way around them. And the idea is that the defender stays you know, defending offline, trying to be as quick as they can, but off the typical racing line, which is where the issues normally come. And the attacker tries to, you know, get them to, to be on the wrong part of the track and find their way around them. And it's that flexibility, it's that um, that means the sim is just really powerful for doing stuff like this, because you can, if you think about it in a different way, you can have, you know, those um, controlled environments, which we could never get to do really in the real world. And finally, um, we've got setup. Um, as I mentioned earlier, conditions change in the real world. We can have static conditions in the sim. And so that really helps set up, um, whether that be, you know, raising rear ride height and trying to feel what it does. And my advice here is the same as in the real world, really. You don't want to be changing setup unless you really have consistency and a good feel in the car. If you don't have good feel in the car and you don't have the consistency there, you won't be able to feel the setup changes. You won't know if it's yourself or whether it's the setup. So you really need to work on all of the fundamental stuff, the vision, how you load the car up into the corner, your trail braking, get that right, get consistent with that first before you even start making setup changes in the sim. And then start off with simple things like initially raising the rear ride height or lowering the rear ride height, which will affect the car in every type of corner and every phase within those corners. And then you can get a bit more creative as you get more comfortable uh, with changing setup. But without a doubt, the sim is a great, great place to change setup. I've got a couple of clients um, who, have, who have started their journey um, with setup or understanding setup in the sim and then transferred that very well um, 
into the real world and that they get a good understanding. As I mentioned at the start, it isn't absolutely perfect. Sometimes I'll make a change and it doesn't do kind of exactly what I expect it to do. But as a whole, um, it is a very good uh, resemblance of what would what would happen in the real world. So I know I've whizzed through all of those points uh, today. I was, I know I went on for uh, for a couple of hours last time. So I've tried to trim it down uh, today and uh, I've done that. We've just kept it within the hour and we've got uh, 10, or, 10 or so minutes longer if you guys want to stick around for some, for, for any questions that you have there. But I mean, I will finish by saying that, you know, the SIM is a fantastic tool if you do use it in the right way and it can certainly make you a better racing driver. Cool, thank you, Scott. Um, that was really interesting to listen to there. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, first one that's come in says, um, are there any series or cars you've particularly enjoyed driving that you can't find in any Sims? Oh, well, yeah, I suppose some of the, um, you know, you, you, you can find some of the old F1, the, you know, the XF1 cars that I've driven in The Sims. People have modified them and created their own, but the quality of the mo mods, as they call them, isn't particularly good. And so that's one thing actually to consider. If you are trying to find a car, try and find it from um, an official source if it exists. And if it doesn't exist, probably try to find a car that's similar from an official source as well. Some of the, some of the kind of third party mods are, are pretty good, but um, some of them can be very bad. So try to, you know, if you're trying to match your race car, try to find one that's similar from, from a good source. Cool. Um, next question. Have any Sims nailed driving in the wet? Um, I wouldn't say they've nailed it, but they've got much closer, um, especially with the last um, release of Assetto Corsa Competizione, ACC. Um, there's two types of Assetto Corsa, and the, the latest one, which is only really GT cars, um, they've got some dynamic um, wet weather conditions. So the circuit dries up, there's a dry line and, and things like that. So that would be... Um, if you you know if you want to work on your wet driving, I would work on that. But it's they only have GT cars on there, which is could be an issue. Cool. Um, Dawn has asked, can you recommend where to buy a good steering wheel and pedals? Hello, Dawn. I, th I think <laughs> is that Dawn Tunbridge. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you can go direct. You can go to um, you can go direct to Fanatec. You can go to Digital Motorsports. Um, have have a good selection. There's 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 there's, there's many out there. Um, for the steering wheel, like the kind of best value for money, I would say, um, is the the Fanatec equipment. Um, F A N A T E C. Um, and then for the pedals, it depends. You know, it depends on your budget. Um. Fanatec are good and Huizinkbelt, uh, which is a, a Dutch company, are very good as well. Uh, I can I can write those names down for you if uh, if anyone wants. But yeah, again, it depends on your budget. Like uh, this 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 pedal that I showed um, to you guys earlier, the pedal set here is almost a thousand pounds, so it, it isn't cheap. But they are really really good. Um, they do a cheaper version that is a six hundred quid, and Fanatec do. Uh, a version that's a bit cheaper than that as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's like many things, you know, if you want the, the absolute, you know, the quality and the feeling in the pedal, it's a bit more expensive. Um, Hector asks, uh, what are the bad habits a sim might introduce which don't translate into the real world? Um, I mean, if, so let's say that you've got, a, 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 you know, a high, a, a high quality sim, that's the first thing to say, because if you, you know, if, if you're not using a high quality sim, then it's very easy to get on the brake in the wrong way or to turn the car into the corner in the wrong way. I'd say the, the biggest issue with them is probably um, if you're not if you're not going along the, the right route with your technique um, and kind of being steered a little bit by a coach, uh, then because of the repetition that you get on the sim, it could be quite easy just to do the same thing wrong 
a thousand times and that gets kind of embedded into your natural style. So you've got to be a little bit careful um, of that. And then the second thing I would say is that you've got to make sure that your mentality is similar to the, to the real world. So, you know, as I mentioned at the start of the seminar, don't just go out there, spin at the third corner and restart and go again and do the same. You need to kind of build up like you would do in the real world. Treat going off the track or making a mistake uh, in, in this kind of same same way that you would do normally. Awesome. Um, Nicole's asked about um, what's the best way of getting some sort of program going with yourselves. I, I think she means um, with Driver 61. So perhaps we could send out some information afterwards um, uh, after after the um, the webinar. Yeah, of course. Uh, we've got, I mean, we've got all the free resources on the website, driver61.com. We do real world training. Uh, we do sim training, which is all, all on the website. So um, yeah, go and have a look there. We can send it cool. out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Tom Bird has um, asked about what would you say the benefits that can be taken from the sim over to real world, real world karting? Um, you know, the, the the obviously carts don't have the you know weight transfer and 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 pitch um, trail breaking things like that like you would do in in uh, in in a in a race car, but things like vision, racing line, racecraft, um, that's what you can what you can take across everything apart from the kind of race car specific uh, like driving technique. And um, we've got quite a number of questions coming in. So I'm just going to ask you a couple more, Scott, and then perhaps we could follow up um, and send out some answers after the webinar um, as a follow up tomorrow. OK, I mean, I'm all right for, for 10 or 15 minutes. If you OK, were. cool. All right. We'll see how many, many we get through and perhaps right. then we, we can answer some afterwards. Um, OK, next question from Peter. How would you structure a sim testing session? Find two hours and do 20 minutes. Uh, 20 minute sessions like on a test day yeah i would i'd do 20 minutes i'd have a cup of tea i'd go and do 20 minutes again give yourself a bit of a break in between i would probably like also change um the the, the track conditions um so that there's a little bit of variability there because the, the danger is if 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 there's no very like I, I know i mentioned that the, the lack of variability can be a good thing but it can also be a bad thing because you just get into this, um, you know, you understand the limits, the, the limit of grip uh, if you don't have any variables. So I, I would actually change it so that that kind of changes as it would do in the real world. Uh, and it's only, you know, it's only small differences, but um, it means that you will have to adapt your technique in a slightly different way. Awesome. Um, somebody has asked, um, do you find that the lap times achieved on a sim can be replicated on a circuit? No, not really. Um, not, not consistently. I, I wouldn't have said so. I think, I think the important thing to, um, for me to say here, and this is a really good point, actually, a uh, really good question, um, is that you don't, don't use the sims so that you can just copy everything when you go into the real world know that they are different it's like jumping into a slightly different car for example the braking points are going to be different the minimum corner speeds are going to be different what the sims are useful for are understanding your technique understanding the journey to extracting the most speed from the car so how you manipulate your your braking trace or whatever that might be um it isn't a case of okay, this car's the same as my, my race car. This track's the same that I'm going to next week. Oh, I'm breaking at that braking board and then going to re repeat it. Uh, I, I would say that that's a, a bit of a tricky area to, to be in. Treat it as something separate. Treat it as a way to push yourself through that journey of finding the limit as many times as you want to, and then take that process and apply it to your, to your race car. Okay, next question. What should I look for in a VR headset? Um, oh, technical question. Okay, this is a difficult <laughs> one. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I've got some further reading materials here. So uh, there's a web website called simracingcockpit.com. I don't know if they have a VR guide on there. 
Um, but check that out because it's really well researched uh, stuff and it's from a racing driver actually. So he's kind of bridging the gap as well. So it's about his sim and the various different things that he's, he's, uh, he's used. Um, I, the refresh rate is important. So how quickly the, the images come up. Um, so that's, uh, that's one thing. And then the resolution is important. But if you, uh, if you look at many of the, the online reviews, I've got an HP one. Um, I know the, 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 the valve indexes are good as well. HP have just released another one as well. Um, but I, uh, I can't give you too many details on that uh, because I, I, I don't know um, what the kind of full range is out there. But take a look at um, Sim Racing Cockpit. I'm sure there's something on there. Uh, Keith asks, do you utilize telemetry in the sim? Yeah, I do actually. Um, so, <laughs> so we coached, um, we coached a couple of the IndyCar drivers, uh, Tony Canan and uh, Adrian Fernandez um, during lockdown uh, when they were doing an eSports championship. Um, and so we used it very heavily then actually, uh, because we were trying to teach with our sim coaches and me, and Tony, we were trying to teach him the, 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 the sim specific techniques. Um, and we used the, 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 the data traces there. There's a fantastic uh, tool called VRS in which you can actually, it's like, you know, it's like VBox software or, or, um, or any other kind of data logging software online. And you can actually download their, their laps um, you know their benchmark laps, and so it's a it's a great resource because you can be you can practice and you can see what the trail breaking is like of of a pro sim driver, and you you know you you can find your way there with that. So yeah, we do use it, and uh, it's quite a powerful tool. Cool. Um, here's a technical question. Hopefully, I get this one right. Uh, it's from Ben Newman. Do you have any preference between a load cell brake pedal setup and a braking circuit made up with a proper hydraulic circuit? with brake calipers and master cylinders, et cetera? Are they worth the extra complexity and expense? Oh, that's a difficult one. To be honest, um, I haven't used one of those for three or four years. So I haven't had a back-to-back -back comparison recently. Um, but so, so, I mean, I'm not really answering this question, but I would say that the, the a, a good quality load cell pedal like I've got here is, is good enough to do what you need to do. So I, I don't know whether the calipers would be worth the extra expense. Cool. Um, Graham Ridgeway asks if there is good coverage of UK circuits. Hi, Graham. Um, yes, there is. Uh, a lot of the MSV circuits have been scanned. Um, Silverstone on a couple of the pieces of software has been scanned as well. So when I say scanned, um, that's important because they, 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 they actually, you know, 3D scan the circuits. And so it's got all the bumps, all the coloring of the curbs is correct. The curbs feel right. Uh, the surfaces are, are all perfect. Um, and so, yeah, all of those UK circuits, uh, Alton, Donington, Silverstone, um, Brands, yeah, they've all, they've all been scanned at a high quality as well. Um, a question about monitors. Would you pick a 49-inch curved monitor over three 27-inch monitors? Oh, that's a good question. So this is a 49-inch um, curved monitor, if you can see there, sorry. Uh, I'd say tri triple screens is probably better there because they come further back. Although I think um, LG are just releasing uh, an even tighter curve. I don't know if it's out yet or it's about to be out. So I haven't tested that yet. So maybe that's the way to go. Uh, but certainly this one is kind of, I'd say it's the, the curvature is about, I don't know, like, a, I don't, I don't know what, it, it's kind of curved like this. It's not particularly curved. Um, I'd say that that isn't great, uh, but triple, triples are better than that. But tr try the VR, the VR is definitely the way to go. Cool. Um, Ian commented on how far sim racing has come um, in the past 20 years and asks, uh, where do you think it will be in another 20 years time? Yeah, um, 20 years. So I'm guessing here, but I think it will be difficult to distinguish between real world and, and the sim by that point. Um, 
already you can see the younger drivers are supplementing their careers with sim racing. Um, you know, you saw La you saw Lando winning uh, a lot of the the IndyCar stuff. He was super fast um, because he spent so much time on there, and it genuinely does help them. Uh, so, in terms of how it's going to affect motorsport as well, I think definitely the connection across real world racing and sim racing to help is is going to improve and that's one of the reasons why we are investing in in sim training and, and developing drivers on that side of things as well awesome um you've got about four or five questions left Are you happy to continue and answer those Scott? yeah of course yep yeah, cool um so we've got a question from molly dodd um do you find it harder to concentrate when driving on simulators in comparison to driving in real life if so how do you deal with this um no, I'd say I'd say not. Um, especially when I'm and keep on going on about the VR, but especially when I'm 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 wearing the VR, um, it's so immersive that I'm focused like I am in the real world. And for for me, that's why I you know I can jump in a sim and and use a different you know piece of software and and a different steering wheel and and and, and whatever it might be. And if I get in and I can be as quick. If I can get up to speed as quickly as I can in the real world and I kind of run through the same processes as I do in the real world, I know that it's a, a, a really good sim and it's useful for, for training because all the all the processes, all the you know, all, all the way that we go about finding the limit is exactly the same. So no, no, I don't lose focus. I would say um, maybe with a single screen, if I were to use a single screen, I might lose focus then simply because it isn't as immersive. Okay, uh, Chris uh, says, could you recommend any software to run with iRacing to help in the sim? I currently use Crew Chief and VRS Telemetry. No, it seems like it's got it sorted. I mean, that's all that all that we run as well. Um, uh, one of one of the things is just to look at the replays. I mean, uh, the great thing about the replays is it shows your your pedal traces um, when when you're looking back, and so. It's the same as when you'd be analyzing a video in the real world, you know, you're looking uh, at the steering wheel, you're looking to see how that steering wheel um, is working in relation to the car to see if you've got understeer, to see if you've got rotation or oversteer. And you can combine, kind of combine that information with what's going on with the pedals and work out how you need to be faster. So you need to look at the body language of the car and then look at what you're doing with the steering wheel and the pedals and that will help you understand the balance of the car and how you might be able to be to be quicker uh can the trailing of brakes be used for karting in the same way as the brakes tend to be on the rear um no it isn't exactly the the same way because the reason that you trail the brakes i i, I think the profile would would it looks pretty similar but you, you're not trying to manipulate or manage the the weight of the car moving around on on the springs in a go kart, um, so it's slightly different. Okay, cool. Uh, last two questions: um, What are the differences between oval NASCAR and circuit racing, Silverstone, for example, in a sim? Uh, uh, that's quite a broad question. Um, it's the same as the, the real world. I mean, I've not done too many oval races. I've just done them for fun. Uh, it's quite good fun, actually. Um, but yeah, I mean, of course, it's just the same as it is in the real world. You know, the, 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 the road circuits, the road courses, um, they're, you know, they're more dynamic um, and you have to turn right sometimes. And the ovals is, 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 is more about being smooth and, and, and those really small, fine margins. Okay. Uh, last question. Um, I have recently signed up for your sim racing course after hearing about it on race department. What I racing tracks would you recommend practicing on? I'm not going to tell him. <laughs> <You've> got, <laughs> <laughs> part of it is that you go to a new track each week and um, you'll, you'll see in the course, we are actually, as I mentioned before, we kind of go between lots of different circuits that, that kind of better describe different techniques that we work on during each each week of that course. So it's a four week program. There's uh, vision, steering, 
uh, breaking and, and, and manipulating the limit. And we go to various different circuits that, that do that. But go along with the course and uh, don't do too much repetition. Try and get there um, in, in that kind of um, in that more realistic way if you are if you are training for the real world. Cool. And um, that's all the questions answered, Scott. Um, did you have any final thoughts you wanted to share before we close off? uh not that i don't th uh, you know i think i've gone over them all really uh, already don't spend too much money on a sim um i know eight grand's a lot of money but uh you know don't go over that i've, I've had clients who've been you know giving me all kinds of silly figures with that uh, to, to to get the thing to do what you want you i'd i'd say between four and eight grand don't go any more than that um if you want to check out some more about um, driving technique, we've got the Drivers University, which is six hours of, of free content into the details of, of racing. Um, we've got our real world training programs and our sim training programs, which are all detailed on the website. And uh, the website that I mentioned earlier, uh, simracingcockpit.com. There's sim building guides if you did want to put your own together and uh, and some setup. Um, files uh, for, for, for your steering wheel and, and pedals and so on. And if you do have any questions, just email me at scott.mansell at drive61.com. Awesome. Thank you very much, Scott. And um, that was really, really insightful. And thank you everyone for attending. I hope you found it useful. Um, as Scott said, if you if you enjoyed the session, check out Driver 61. Um, and if you'd like to see more from Scott and our other guest speakers, um, you can head to Motorsport UK website to sign up to uh, some further um, webinars in the series. Uh, thanks again, everyone, um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, guys. Uh, looking forward yes. to seeing you in, in the next ones as well. Thank you.